Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android device, Kindle, or MP3 player. We want to give a big thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon. And if you'd like to join our growing numbers, you can go to patreon.com slash I Know Dino. This week, we have an interview with Dr. David Hone, who's a really interesting paleontologist out of Queen Mary University of London. And he just wrote a new book all about tyrannosaurs. Our dinosaur of the day is Oranosaurus, and we have a bunch of exciting dinosaur news. There's always exciting dinosaur news. There really is. Sometimes I worry, what if there isn't any news this week, but there always is. (laughs) Sometimes there's too much news. Yeah. So we're going to kick it off with our interview with Dr. David Hone. We are joined this week by Dr. David Hone. He is a lecturer in zoology at Queen Mary University of London. He has a blog called Archosaur Musings, where he talks about dinosaurs and pterosaurs, and has contributed to the naming of more than a dozen animals, mostly dinosaurs. His research focuses primarily on how dinosaurs behaved, and he recently published a book titled The Tyrannosaur Chronicles, The Biology of the Tyrant Dinosaurs. So I saw that you were originally working with living animals as a zoologist, before making the switch to dinosaurs. Can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to switch? I think decided is probably a strong word. As with so much in (laughs) academia with research opportunities at master's, PhD level and even beyond, it's really more about serendipity and, and how these things go. So as a child, I'd always been interested in any live animal virtually. A few things didn't really grab me. But you know, any live and, and indeed plenty of dead things, including dinosaurs, um, Dimetrodon, Megalosaurus, various, you know, the, all the key things that everyone always cites that got them excited. Yeah. And I had no real preference for living or dead, probably living, slightly edging it. I wasn't a child who was dinosaur, 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 even though, of course, I thought dinosaurs were great. <laughs> um, and so I did a degree in zoology, which was obviously a much more general degree, though I actually did the one available paleontology course as part of that. Mm. And then it was only when I was doing my master's course that a project on dinosaurs actually came up and was available for a research project. And I thought, well, that looks kind of fun. And a good friend of mine was very into dinosaurs and was kind of getting me back into it at the time. And so I took that on. And then, of course, I'm hunting around for a PhD and I've just done a thing on dinosaurs. Mm. So obviously, when a paleontology PhD became available and I was somewhat suited to it and they was already in contact with the supervisor over what I'd done for my master's, then, well, it wasn't a big surprise that I kind of fell into it. But I'd applied and obviously not got for projects on fish behavior and birds. And, uh, you know, so I applied for a whole bunch of PhDs. But the one that I got offered first was in paleontology. It was actually on pterosaurs. And then, of course, once you've done a PhD, you're kind of a paleontologist <laughs> at this point. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, I do still retain an interest in lots of living species. I try and work them into my research. It forms a major part of my teaching as well. But, yeah, when you speak to a lot of paleontologists and obviously particularly guys who do dinosaurs and you know the big mesozoic reptiles it's that's what i always wanted to do from age dot and i'm quite an anomaly in that sense in that i was just interested in everything yeah and that's what i happened to drift into yeah well i can relate because i was interested in everything too and i have a degree in engineering and now i'm just immersing myself in dinosaurs so i totally understand just loving all of the science and you know yeah and it just whatever bit grabs you or becomes available or is appropriate at the time exactly Um, yeah yeah if i if i you know not taken it i took a year out between my degree and my master's if i hadn't done that that project would probably never been available and none of this would have happened so it's um there's a lot of uh coincidence and luck and chance that goes into all this for sure yeah oh huge amounts i think more than a lot of people realize you know, yes, you've obviously got to be interested and dedicated, but the number of people who said, well, you know, I always had this fascination with mammals, but then I was asked to look after the slugs <laughs> for a couple of weeks. And and now, you know, they're mad on slugs or <laughs> snakes or jellyfish or amoeba in which they probably never even considered before. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So in that respect, do you have a favorite dinosaur? 
I do, and for the dinosaur kind of literate audience, it might make sense that I keep saying I need to find a new favourite because they do lots of outreachy stuff and I do lots of events with kids and they always ask this and I bring it up and then of course they've never heard of it and then I have to try and explain why I find it interesting Mm -hmm. and the attention span just drops because I think I'm going to say T-Rex. Yeah. My favourite thing is actually a Margosaurus. Even though I've never seen one, I've never even seen a cast of one. And for those who don't know, this is a sauropod, but it's very odd because it's really quite small for a sauropod. Mm -hmm. And it's got a pretty short neck for a sauropod. And then it's got these really weird row of kind of double spines coming out the neck, which is something virtually no other sauropod has. It's part of a group called the Dicreosaurs, and they do have rather unusual kind of getting towards ornamented necks. But compared to every other sauropod, these are quite unusual. So I like it because it's it's a kind of a rule breaker. It's, it's small, not big. It's got a short neck, not a long neck, and the neck is actually really interesting. And I do have a lot of work and a great deal of interest in signals, communication, socially, sexually selected structures, displays. And this has pretty much all the hallmarks of that. And that's actually quite odd when the rest of the sauropods are largely free, or at least if they are doing something like this, they're doing it in a very, very different way. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. We have a little model of that one. (laughs) I've got two tiny ones that I picked up at some fossil show years ago for a euro each in Germany, and they were Chinese and hand painted. And they're one of the most accurate little dinosaur models I've ever seen. And I've never seen them again. The guy had like a whole crate of them. (laughs) And I just bought a couple because I went, oh, they're neat. Yeah, and everyone who sees them go, wow, where the hell did you get them? I like, no <laughs> idea. Never seen them before. Never see them again. This one day, this guy, and he had nothing else. He had nothing else but a Marcosaurus in two colors. So I have the gray one and the orange one. And that's it. <laughs> that is great. Yeah, I, I kind of have the same problem. Mine is a little bit more common. I, my favorite is Ankylosaurus, but mm. I was just at the grocery store and I was wearing a Stegosaurus shirt and the woman said, that's my favorite dinosaur. And she mentioned how like, well, maybe it wasn't the smartest dinosaur, but I still like it. And I was like, yeah, and Kylosaurus is my favorite. And he probably wasn't too bright either. And she looked at me like I was speaking a foreign language. Yeah. So. <laughs> Jumping into a little bit of your work, you wrote about protoceratops and that it likely developed its frill for either sexual display or social dominance. So can mm-hmm. you tell us a little bit about how you got to that conclusion and what you think? Yeah, well, as I just said with the, the kind of socio-sexually selected signaling structures, this is something I've been a major part of and been driving for the last few years. And I think it kind of comes from my background as a more general biologist. Mm-hmm. And so just looking, you know, everyone's familiar with some of the more exaggerated things that you see in various dinosaurs. Yeah, the arbor and ankylosaurs, but the plates in stegosaurus, the big crests in the hadrosaurs, the obviously the frills in the ceratopsians, mm-hmm. but there's horns and stuff in various theropods and so on and so forth. And bizarrely, these had kind of been written off from being sexually selected. I mean, you, you take one look at these in anything like a deer, a lion, yeah. so many birds, and go, well, this is a sexually selected structure. It's a big look at me signal in some way, shape or form. This is an animal either looking for a mate and going, hey, I'm, I'm healthy, you know, let's get more intimate. Or just a, look, I'm big and healthy, I'm in charge, or, you know, I get to eat first kind of dominant structure. This kind of got discussed in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then kind of been abandoned um, Mm. pretty much on the grounds that most of the time when we see it, we see it in virtually every specimen. So, you know, every triceratops we've ever found, and there's dozens of them, they all have a frill and it's all pretty big. And people were going, yeah, but that's not what you see in sexual selection. What you see is the really pretty peacock and the dull peahen. You see the maned lion and the maneless lioness. Yeah. You see the giant elephant seal with the inflatable nose, and the females are kind of small and boring. That's not what we see here. Therefore, it must have been something else. And this was rampant in, particularly rampant in paleontology. It was actually pretty common in biology. But where people have gone wrong is there's a thing called mutual sexual selection which is basically where males are advertising to females and going, hey, look at me, I'm big and sexy and strong. (laughs) But also females are advertising to males. And of course, they're advertising using exactly the same signal. And actually, Thomas Henry Huxley, you know, a contemporary of Darwin, Mm -hmm. who was writing with Darwin, with collaborating, but writing similar things and was a very strong proponent of evolution and natural selection, had written as early as something like 1905 about mutual sexual selection and we should look out for this and it's probably a real thing. Darwin had even mentioned it in his original book on sexual selection and then kind of ruled it out because he didn't think that there would be a reason that you might get this. So he said, maybe there's a thing called mutual sexual selection with males and females and then said, but I can't think of any examples, so I'm going to drop it. But Huxley had kind of taken this up and run with it a little bit, but both sides were still kind of shorn of an example and therefore didn't really go anywhere, even though as a concept it was out there. 
And it was only, I think, in the 80s, but then particularly in the 90s and 2000s, that the biologists realized that actually it's not only is it out there, but it's really quite common. And what it's probably linked to, at least to a certain degree, is care. Where we see the big exaggerated male and the boring female, it's because the males are probably contributing little, if anything, to the upkeep of their offspring. So basically, it's all about the advertising, <laughs> because as far as they're concerned, the female is just there to raise their offspring. Therefore, they should be having as many partners as possible, and the females aren't getting anything back from the male. So it's one male, lots of females, provided you're a healthy male, of course. Yeah. What you see of course, with mutual sexual selection is, well, the females are relying on the males. So it, to a certain degree, so the males are helping build the nest, for example, or helping catch food for the offspring or keeping predators away or just keeping the female generally well fed while she's getting ready to lay eggs, etc., etc. And then, of course, it's in the male's interest to get hold of a good female because it's not just a question anymore of just mating and running off and never seeing them again. You're now putting tons of effort into this. And if you're putting in tons of effort, you don't want to put that all into a very low quality female who's going to have rubbish young or may not be able to have any at all. You want a good female. And so suddenly, not quite the gloves on the other foot, but it's much more closer to a partnership. A female wants a good male for the best of her offspring, but now the male wants a good female for the best of his offspring. Well, how's a female going to explain, as it were, to a male that she's a healthy mate? Well, the obvious thing to do is do exactly what the male's already doing and go down the route of showing up. And this is what we actually see when we start looking. Huge numbers of species now that people are really studying this have this mutual sexual selection, mutual advertising features. The common starling, the European starling, which I know is also introduced into the US and so very common over there. These big glossy animals, got little glossy animals. Um, but it's been shown that on both sexes, that's a sexually selected structure. If you dull down the brightness of that iridescence, and it's particularly bright under UV, which of course birds can see, then the males become much less interested in a dull female, as well as females being less interested in the dull male. Wow. Um, it's really rampant in birds, actually, uh, which, of course, is interesting since they are dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, it's quite common in fish. We've, we're starting to see it in a few other groups as well. It's probably a lot more common than we think once we actually get around to looking for it mm. properly. Very long story short, we need to stop thinking that dinosaurs can't be under sexual selection just because males and females probably look the same. <laughs> We simply can't rule it out. And actually, once you do that, you realize that actually these frills and spikes and horns and crests have a huge amount in common with sexually selected structures, both in terms of their general appearance a lot of the time with various other species, but also how they grow. And this is because when you're a baby, you're mostly interested in not being eaten and getting big enough to one day mate yourself. Mm -hmm. Once you're an adult, you're very interested in mating and therefore attracting a member of the opposite sex. And therefore, exactly as you see in living species, babies of things like deer basically don't have antlers at all. Things like cows, various antelope, sheep, they might have a nub. Uh, you know, the horn might start to grow, but it's not really doing very much. And then suddenly when they're nearly an adult, <clears throat> these things grow massively overnight. So what you see is very small size early on and then very rapid growth just when they start to hit basically reproductive maturity. And actually, if you look at the dinosaurs, that's exactly what you see. And in particular, we looked at Protoceros andrews eye because it was a species where we had lots and lots of individuals. We had very small juveniles, mid-sized juveniles, sub-adults and adults. They're all from the same formation. So actually, it's pretty much one population rather than scattered specimens from all over Mongolia and China. And when you measure the frills, yeah, that's what you see. They're basically non-existent in babies. They're sort of growing in the juveniles, but they're still tiny. And then the sub-adult and adult animals, which as far as we can tell are reproductively mature, they're enormous. So they've grown very, very quickly just when these animals are probably starting to look for a mate. So they have everything in common. Makes sense. Well, it does. <laughs> and yet some people are surprisingly resistant to this as a hypothesis. Do you think part of that is just that in mammals, like humans, for instance, males and females don't look the same and don't have the same sexual, you know, alpha male looks totally different than alpha female, so they assume um, dinosaurs Yeah, I do. guess so, but it, it's, you know, there is obviously still mate choice, <laughs> you know, yeah. obviously in, you know, advanced Western society, but, you know, even if you go back and look at, you know, early tribal societies, at least what we understand of them and all the rest of it, you know, you still expect to see the same thing is that there's still advertising effectively on both sides. Mm -hmm. and There is choice and in investment on both sides. 
yes, I think there is a still a kind of human inertia or dimorphism inertia because it's what people expect. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know about a lot of these bird and fish examples and others, it's still what you see because it is very still very common in mammals Yeah, a lot of the time. So I think that is almost certainly a big part of it. The other thing that I'd say is not that I don't think it isn't the solution to a lot of this stuff, but we've also got to be very careful about what we say about even big groups of individuals in the fossil record, even things like Triceratops, where yeah, we're now in the region of something like 100 decent specimens for this. Mm -hmm. We don't know what their behavior was like. We don't know if, in addition to all, obviously all the other biases we have when we go out and find fossils, whether or not there's actually a, a male-female one. There's a whole bunch of species you can go and look at, and the males do one thing and the females do another. Mm. They live different lives, mostly in different places, doing different things and kind of come together to breed and go back again. So if one group is living in the lowland floodplain areas where anything that dies has a decent chance of being buried and ultimately becoming a fossil, and another group is living in the upland areas and only wanders down for a few weeks each year, and maybe that's when the rains aren't so there's no flooding, <laughs> you're almost only ever going to sample one sex and not the other. Mm. And this is a big deal. You know, you will see, you know, Centrosaurus famously and a few of the others you know, we have bone beds with 100, 200 individuals in, and several people have gone, well, no dimorphism, and that's got to be 50-50. You know, <laughs> you can't sample 100 animals or 200 animals and not have something close to 100 males and 100 females. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a herd of over 100 giraffe before, and they were all females or juveniles, because males don't usually hang around with the females at all. Loads and loads of antelope in particular you have what are called bachelor herds, and they're all the young non-breeding males. Mm. And then what you have is a harem of females with one male. So actually, if you sample an entire herd, what you'll almost certainly sample is either one male with like 20 females and young, or about 50 males. What you won't ever get is 50 males and 50 females. So it can be ludicrously misleading, even when you've got huge numbers of individuals. And, of course, there's mortality rates. Male giraffe die at three or four times the rate of females because they live on their own and they spend all their time wandering from herd to herd to herd looking for estrous females, mm. whereas females live in groups where they've got some kind of mutual protection and defense. So actually, even if you sampled all adult giraffe today in a population, you wouldn't expect a 50-50 ratio. You'd probably expect four or five to one. Mm. The classic 50-50 sex ratio is there for a reason at birth, but that doesn't mean that's what you'd expect in a normal, evolving, natural population. So that's the other factor. I, I would not be at all surprised. In fact, I would actually suspect that some of these species that we know of from 10, 20, 50, 100 animals, we've only actually got one sex represented. The problem is we don't know which one that is and we don't know what sex it is. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a problem that I'm sure, sure exists. How we solve it, it's probably insolvable. Though plenty of people have said that before only to find out they were wrong <laughs> five or 50 years later. Yeah, that's the nature of science. <laughs> I know you found a big group of protoceratops in the same area and made a couple of inferences about how they behaved and how they lived together. Is this related to that discovery? To a degree. So we certainly use that that data as part of the um, frill growth paper. Um, I should clarify, I didn't find these, or at least I found them only in the sense that they were in a museum in Japan <laughs> I was in at the time and asked if anyone was working on them was told no. Uh, that was the limit <laughs> of my discovery. Uh, though I actually only found out literally just before we sent the paper off that they'd been found something like 15 years earlier and had just been sitting around. I'd, I'd assumed they'd been dug up a couple of years before, otherwise someone would have leapt on them <laughs> the first time they saw them. So yeah, I was, I was shocked to discover that these things have been knocking around since the 90s. It was ridiculous. Wow. But yeah, no, it's a little group of four protoceratops. They're young, very young. Uh, we haven't got any histology work. We don't know how old they are. Based on their size and what we know, my guess would be under a year old, though. So they're pretty small animals, wow. maybe about 50 centimeters, probably less, more like 35, 40 from snout to the tip of the tail. So we are talking about small individuals here. You know, the skull is about the size of my fist, pretty much. Hmm. Um, and yeah, so it was, a, it was a group that was found together. There are a whole bunch of dinosaurs which are known from groups, in particular from deserts. It seems to be common that whatever the preservation there does tend to preserve whole groups locked up. But what was neat about this is there was a very young group of protoceratops already known 
actually at the same museum, which had been described as being in a nest, which we were very skeptical of. <laughs> um, but regardless, the, the point is still generally true. So we had this very small group. They're about half the size of even our tiny ones. These things really were very young. Then we have at least one group of what are traditionally called sub-adults, so not quite adult size, but retaining a lot of those features, you know, the human equivalent being a kind of late teenager, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. You kind of look like an adult, but you've probably got a couple of years growing still to go. And then adults. And there were groups known for all of these. So we've got four different life stages, effectively, and they're always in a group. And that had never been seen before. Yes, we have lots of groups of dinosaurs, uh, but actually being able to demonstrate that the same species formed in particular, age-segregated groups throughout their life. We don't find big ones with babies. We don't find sub-adults with adults. We don't find adults with juveniles. We don't find juveniles with tiny juveniles. They're always of about the same size and age. And this is, as far as we know, unique. I'm very sure it's not unique among dinosaurs, but it's obviously extremely difficult to determine. You need multiple, multiple records of entire groups having been preserved together. And you've also got to be confident that it's the same species every time. Yeah. Because, of course, juveniles don't always look just like adults. The reason we can get away with this with Protoceratops is that Protoceratops Andrew's eye has a unique tooth. It has a little kind of fang-like tooth at the front of its jaw that other Protoceratops species and close relatives don't have. And that is present even in the hatchlings. So we're very confident that we've got the same species and that that actually helps enormously with this ID and the inference. But yeah, what that tells you is that these things are hanging around in groups. It also actually helps the sociosexual stuff because it means it's probably not a dominant signal. Even juveniles will generally have a leader or an alpha of some description. And that hasn't grown a bigger frill. So, you know, even though they're still living in a group, so it suggests that it really is a much more adulty function. <laughs> but also it tells you that this isn't anything like armor or protection from predators, because again, the juveniles are going to be vulnerable, probably more vulnerable to predators than the adults. Yeah. Why haven't they grown the frill? But also in particular, it tells you that these things are actually hanging around together. And we know that one of the biggest drivers of group living in herbivores is predation. It's it's a vigilance defense and a dispersal defense against carnivores. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have every reason to think that actually this group living and this clustered group living throughout ontogeny for protoceratops is basically a fundamental defense against being eaten. Makes sense. Are there living animals that kind of have the same behavior that you would... Um, to to a degree the the problem that you have with this stuff of course is what we what we'd like to use often for behavioral models are either birds because they are dinosaurs or mammals because they are at least big terrestrial animals Mm -hmm. you know they're large macroscopic things (laughs) uh, which is at least an ecological you know so even evolutionary match for something like a large herbivore or at least an ecological match for a large herbivore and the Mm -hmm. problem that we've got of course is that both birds and mammals typically have or at least all except marsupials, have offspring at a very appreciable percentage of adult size. You know, birds are often hatching chicks that are 30% of adult mass, oh, yeah. and they're rearing them within just a couple of months. You know, they, they lay their eggs in March, and by June you've got a fully-fledged bird, which is 90% of the size of mum and dad. Mm-hmm. Mammals perhaps aren't quite so extreme, but even so, you know, a baby elephant is, you know, a couple hundred kilos, <laughs> uh, which is still a big percentage of two, three-ton female for, for an African elephant, whereas this isn't the case for dinosaurs. They're much more like crocodiles, where... They're laying, you know, 40, 50, 100 eggs, and each one is coming out, you know, an adult protoceratops is about two meters. And the, these hatchling slash nestling things, which already may be a few weeks or months old, this is the quote unquote nest, mm-hmm. you know, they're like 10, 15 centimeters long. Oh, wow. It's going to be 1% or less of the mass of the female, probably more like half a percent of the mass of the female. So, you know, they've got years and an awful lot of size to grow through. So they've actually got a very, very different trajectory. A much better analog is some of the bigger lizards, you know, Komodo dragons, branids, big iguanas, and of course the crocodiles. That's exactly what the crocs are doing. But of course, we don't know that much about their biology because for all the study that we do, watching a crocodile go throughout its whole life, it lives in water. There are adult crocs Mm -hmm. around. Seeing what it does day and night and underwater is basically impossible. 
So tracking that whole group, and of course, they're often macro carnivores, you know, even very young baby crocodiles, other than big adult crocs and maybe a few big turtles and fish, not a lot's going to eat them. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a very different case for baby protoceratops, but also most baby dinosaurs, to be honest. Um, So it is difficult to line up a really good analogy, whether that be ecological or evolutionary, for what these animals were doing. So yes, do a lot of animals do that? Sort of. I think a lot of the lizards do that. The iguana certainly form clusters of single age groups throughout their life, and then they kind of split off as they get closer to adult size. That's probably the best we can do. But it does all fit with what we know of the ecology of various living species, what we see for the dinosaurs, for things like bite marks, stomach contents. We know juveniles are getting targeted. I think it makes a lot of sense absolutely demonstrating it going to be tricky (laughs) as so many things are you know even for the basics of how big an animal was it's hard enough to do in paleo let alone what was their behavior throughout their lifetime yeah definitely you've spent a lot of time working in china and i I couldn't find too much about working in other parts of the world but i was wondering if you found differences in excavating in the uk versus china i know that China has some amazing preservation of things like feathers and small yeah. fossils. Yeah, well, the, the funny thing is I've never really dug in the UK because we don't have too many good dinosaur beds over here. Yeah. Uh, and mostly what we do have are very well exploited, and in particular they're exploited by local collectors. Hmm. Um, so the, the kind of southwest coast where Mary Anning was starting out, hmm. you know, every single day there will be, you know, 100, 150 professionals out scouring the cliffs for anything that's fallen out the cliff, washed up, been exposed by the tide. We're not going to compete with that, so paleontologists just generally don't try. So there's no restrictions on, like, private collecting on those cliffs? Well, so it's it's the beach, and the coast in the UK is basically owned by the Queen, and therefore it is effectively public land, and anything you find there is yours. Uh, So, yeah, again, the laws vary from country to country having spent two years in germany they also vary from state to state in Mm -hmm. germany so the laws in bavaria are different to the rest of germany brazil has recently and correctly tightened up their laws on collecting ownership and export but anything collected before that law came in don't count when someone just turns up with a rock and said oh well i dug it up 50 years ago you try proving they didn't (laughs) You know, so things get complicated. In the UK, in the Jurassic Coast, as it's called, though it goes actually from Triassic through to the end Jurassic, entertainingly, the cliffs themselves are World Heritage Site. So all the fossils are basically falling out of the cliff. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to dig in the cliff because that's damaging a World Heritage Site, but it's constantly eroded because twice a day the tide comes in and washes some of it down. <laughs> so you are allowed to pick up anything that has fallen off the cliff or is falling out of the cliff. In other words, if you see a piece of bone sticking out, you are allowed to pick that up and pull it out. Hmm. You are not allowed to dig behind it for what you think may be there. This has led to some fantastic complications. There's an amazing Scolidosaurus, an early armored dinosaur, arguably one of the best preserved and most important ornithischians full stop, is from here, and it is collectively owned by three different people because three different people pull different bits of it out of the cliff at different times. We know it's all one specimen because all the bits line up. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is actually on display in a museum in Bristol. And actually, there are some casts of it which have been sent to the US and sold. But the specimen itself is still owned by three people. And of course, getting that into public hands is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Because of course, whoever folds first and sells their piece has just made the others more valuable. Yeah. So who's going to sell first? No one. Are you going to get them to agree? Well, one guy basically owns the head. So it's by far the smallest piece, but it's also the most valuable scientifically. And you're just doomed. Uh, not, not that I'm wishing this on them, but you know, until people start dying it and bequeathing it to another generation or run into money troubles and are absolutely forced to sell, mm-hmm. it's in no one's interest to give up, sell, or give away any part of this specimen. And while it is on display and some tentative bits have fitted into the literature because there are at least some photos and things doing the rounds, it's kind of off limits to research, even though it's sat there in plain view. And we know we're never going to get our hands on it. So, yeah, that's really annoying. Um, Going back to answer your actual question about digging. So, yeah, I've dug up for like one day in and one afternoon in Oxford. I did some digging and and found a few bits. I've done a little bit of digging in Mexico, just a couple of days. 
in Cochila, the area of Cochila Ceratops and Velifrons and a bunch of new stuff's coming out. And I've done a little bit of kind of prospecting up in Alberta around the Tyrrell Museum and Dinosaur Provincial Park. Oh, cool. The only serious digging I've actually ever done was when I was in China and ended up digging all over China. Though I never really got actually into the Liaoning in northeast where actually yet yeah, all these spectacular preservation of all the feathers, um, mm-hmm. filamented pterosaurs. Dromosaurids. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that stuff. I've been there and I've had a couple of afternoons, you know, smacking stuff with a hammer to see if anything <laughs> fell out. But I've never been part of a serious organized dig up there. Where I have been is in the Gobi Deserts. So in the Cretaceous stuff, Predoceratops, Velociraptor and all of that stuff in the northwest or very, very west up in the north, which is the middle Jurassic stuff. Uh, so yeah. Mementisaurus, but Guanlong, mm-hmm. uh, crested tyrannosaur and a lot of early interesting radiations going on there and then down south or south center in hunan i've done some work and some digging down there where we pulled out um a new hadrosaur whose name suddenly escapes me uh, because i can't remember what it was called (laughs) in the end Uh, but i helped dig i helped dig that up uh and a bunch of eggs and some other things yeah, I looked up a few of the dinosaurs that you were involved with discovering, and mm. there were a couple where I'm like, I'm not even going to try to say this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, some of the names in China in particular get political because you're often allowed to dig only at the kind of behest of the local authority. Mm. And as soon as you turn something up, they want it named after their province or region or town. Yeah. And given that you probably want to go back, it's quite a good idea if you name it after them. It's not the end of the world, but I do get a bit bored of place name Asaurus, place name Raptor, you know, place name Titan and, and yeah. similar things like this. But yeah, there's a, there's a reason for a few of them at least. Yeah, especially because if you look at that species, it almost certainly wasn't just in that town and it might give well, of people course, a bad well, of impression. Course not. But of course, you, you may never find another one. So yeah. until you do, it's, it's only named from, yeah, six square feet where you dug it. <laughs> Very true. You were also involved in the discovery of Anchiornis huxleyi, which is one of my favorites because it had mm-hmm. such well-preserved melanosomes, which gave a pretty complete color pattern. But yeah. I don't think when you guys dug it up, you knew that. But was there anything about the fossil that you could tell was in particularly good shape or anything where you thought there yeah. might be something? Again, that's, that's one of those ones where yeah, I had nothing to do with its excavation. I'm not sure the IVPP, so this is where I was, the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology. Uh, trips off the tongue which is why everyone calls it ivpp mm-hmm. um i'm not sure it was actually dug up by our group i think it was actually dug up by another group over there and it ended up with us okay it may have even been a farmer who dug it up because obviously they're digging up a lot of stuff over there and again there, there's some confusion over the specimens because anchiornis now turns out to be one of these ludicrously common things now we know what we're looking at <laughs> and so the original specimen which we named is not very well preserved at all and oh, really? i as so I recall, it's headless. The one that everyone associates with Anchiornis was described a few months later in Nature or mm-hmm. Science, one of the two. And that's a spectacular specimen with complete feathers on the arms and, and hind limbs and a great skull. And it's this beautiful specimen split in half with the left and right sides on display. By that time, we'd already named Anchiornis after a fairly broken fragment. Mm. Um, and then actually, the, the one which was mostly sampled for the melanosomes was another specimen again. Oh, wow. I'm pretty sure it was a third one, which, again, is not as good as the spectacular one, but considerably better than the one we named. Wow. Um, so when we named it, we kind of knew what it was in the sense that, although it was badly broken and crushed and bits missing, the characters lined it up very obviously as this super base of the split between birds and dromaeosaurs and truodontids. Mm-hmm. Um, and depending on quite whose analysis you used and quite which data and characters of the anatomy you looked at it kind of flitted between it's a dromaeosaur it's a truodontid it's a bird it collapses the branches between the two so you can't tell them apart anymore etc and so yeah anchiornis near bird it is as near to a bird as anything we've seen at that point though of course with a few bits missing and then the new specimen the second specimen the nature specimen came out and it was pretty clear that it was a truodontid but it still had an awful lot of ties and obviously, we already had Microraptor, this famous dromaeosaurid with mm-hmm. big long feathers on the legs. Actually, Archaeopteryx has that, but people don't realize because the best specimen, the Berlin one, someone actually prepped them off. Um, oh. So if you look at photos of, of the Berlin Archaeopteryx back from the 30s and 40s, it's got these amazing leg feathers. And you look at it now and it doesn't. Oh. Um, 
But of course, it's therefore public and actually even a lot of scientific imagination has Archaeopteryx as not having these big feathered legs or trousers, as they're often called. Mm -hmm. But actually, we had that in Archaeopteryx, we had that in Microraptor, and then we turn it up in Anchiornis, and it's suddenly very obvious that actually this is a universal and feathery legs and feathery feet are actually kind of an ancestral condition for birds. And actually, there was a big shift early on. So yeah, it is a great question, but it tells you something about the science. Actually, I had almost nothing to do with Anchiornis. I helped out on writing some of the paper and looking at a couple of the characters. But I think there were 10 or 12 authors on the paper that named it. Mm -hmm. And then, as I say, as soon as, as soon as that happened, we realized it was an infinitely better specimen up the road. Uh, and once the naming was taken care of and we knew roughly what it was, other people went to work on that. So I didn't discover it. I didn't dig it up. And I had very little to do with the um, description or indeed the naming. In fact, my major contribution to the naming was moaning about the species name. Because mm -hmm. it's Anchiornis Huxleyi, Huxley, who are named after T.H. Huxley, who I'd mentioned. And not that I have anything against him. In fact, I have an awful lot for him. But he's one of those people who keeps having stuff named after them. Yeah. Um, and I felt there were a few other early evolutionary biologists, early bird and early dinosaur researchers who hadn't really been honored in that way. And wasn't it a good time to give one of them a name or name something for their credit and I got overruled mm. yeah, so again no, you know nothing against Huxley and uh, you know Darwin is perhaps the ultimate one I was going to say not yeah. suggesting Darwin is not due an awful lot of credit but the number of species that are Darwin I now it's like there are other biologists <laughs> You know, it's a great honor for people, but not everyone has to name something from every family after him. That's funny. Yeah, so you didn't really discover it, but you kind of opened the floodgates of talk about it, I guess. So that's really Yeah, good. I mean, it was, it's one of those things which in hindsight, I think everyone saw coming that that split between the birds and some of the other dromaeosaurs were not going to be as clear cut as you expected. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things in paleo, knowing that there's almost certainly a lot more to that story than you can see, and actually finding the specimens that demonstrate that that's the case are two very, very different things indeed. You know, if we did not have the Liao Ning beds, I think we would still be just as confident that dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor are very close to Archaeopteryx and tell you something about the origin of birds. But this super fine splitting between the Truodontids, the dromaeosaurs, and the early birds would not be the case at all, because we've just got so many things from the same time and the same place shortly after the split that it's really hard to tell them apart makes sense i kind of yeah. like those specimens the best though because they really show the evolution of it and without the basal ones you wonder how did this fit together anyway yeah well they do and they don't because of course they're all flat so all of them have got kind of flattened crushed oh, bones some of them are split down the middle so the, the, the second classic kind of anchiornis specimen as I say, it's a, it looks like a left and right. What it actually is, is you've sectioned through the bones. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the inside of the left and right <laughs> bone on each side, not the outside, which of course we can see in everything else. So that they, they look spectacular yeah. um, as, as a kind of first approximate view. And yes, of course, there's ludicrous and critical information in them, in particular in the feathers and stuff. But actually, when you go, hmm, I wonder if it, this has that little nub on the bone that you see in Velociraptor. Well, I can't see it because I'm looking at the inside of the bone, not the <laughs> outside of the bone. And to get to the outside, I'd have to prep back into the rock from the other side and almost certainly destroy it. Mm. So you just kind of sit there twiddling your thumbs going, yeah, it's shattered. It looks like someone's hit it with a hammer. And I'm kind of out. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they can look a lot better than they are. But that doesn't mean they're not very, very important. Cool. So I have one more question before we talk about your book. And it's, I want to ask you about it because... I think being a zoologist, you probably have a better understanding of this than anybody else I've talked to. We'll, we'll, see, how, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> I, I'm hoping because it's a question I've been wondering for a while. So I've seen estimates that there are maybe about 1,800 different genera throughout the Mesozoic of dinosaurs. Yeah, 1,500 is the one I'd go with. But yeah, we're yeah. in the in the ballpark it depends how you argue that i was erring on the high side because of the yeah yeah yeah. no i mean some people tell you there's 1100 it really depends on your uh, quite what you're prepared to synonymize but sorry carry yeah. on. so right now though there are 2200 bird genera and yeah and how does that it doesn't make any sense to me that you can have these hundreds of millions of years of dinosaurs yeah. 
and have less than birds is it that um, birds fill so many more niches or is there... yeah I, i've been meaning to write a paper about this a little kind of speculative review paper on this for a while so i hope i'm not giving it away and someone's going to rip me off um basically the dinosaur numbers are simultaneously far too high and far too low <laughs> which is which is problematic so basically and trying not to drag this out for 20 minutes because i can really talk about this because i've thought about it a lot yeah, we should expect a shed load more because simply, yeah, the volume of time we're looking at is a fraction of what it is for the others. Exactly. So we need to add lots more in. Secondly, we need to add a shed load more because there's lots of areas which are under or entirely unexplored. Yes, we've got a spectacular entire formation for China, but that's still only one place at one time. What we don't have it is 50 million late years later and 50 million years earlier at mm -hmm. the same spot. And of course, we're almost certainly never going to get that. But it also, we're not, you know, animals don't get buried and fossilized in mountain ranges. So, yeah. okay, they're quite rare. You know, they don't have too many species, but we're never going to sample anything from the alpine environment pretty much ever. Things from rainforests don't preserve well because they just break down too fast. So again, we're short on species. So once you start adding those together, yes, of course, we're missing ludicrous numbers of species. There must have been thousands more, tens of thousands more than we've named and described because so much time we're not sampling, so much area we're not sampling, so many environments we're not sampling. That's going to push the number way, 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 way up. Mm. Unfortunately, we then need to cut it down enormously. First of all, because one thing we do know is that over time, diversity does tend to increase. Even when you account for all the fossil biases that we know of, there are more species alive. Well, I'd say now, but obviously we've got a big human-driven mass extinction. Go back a few thousand years or a few tens of thousand years. But there are generally more species and indeed more clades than there were 50 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, because stuff does split up more and more and more. Hmm. There's a reason we've still got coelacanths and sharks and things like this hanging around. There's only a few of them, but they hang on. Mm -hmm. So that will cut the number down because life was probably just less diverse in the Mesozoic. And then the second thing we need to cut down is, yeah, birds in particular are going to be good at exploiting niches that a lot of the dinosaurs aren't. Because, you know, when you're very small, you can exploit a small niche. It does not take much food to feed an entire population of birds that are 10 grams each that won't feed one sauropod so inevitably you're going to have more species if things are small and actually most dinosaurs are quite big <laughs> so that is actually is going to cut the number down one sauropod is going to fill the niche of maybe multiple species of antelope because it just consumes so much yeah and then you need to cut it down again because we've probably got multiple niche occupation again that point i made earlier about how these animals grow you know, female antelope or female elephant is feeding herself, but she's still exploiting the same food that she feeds on to keep herself going as she does to get her baby from 0% of her mass to 10, 15% of her mass post birth and post lactation period. Mm -hmm. And then the baby starts feeding for itself and it's now 30, 40% of mum's size, certainly 15, 20% of mum's size. Not true of the dinosaurs. A hatchling sauropod might be a meter long and it's got to get to 30, 40 meters in length and multiply by a thousand, two thousand times in mass. Oddly enough, that's probably occupying at one size. If you go to Serengeti, just because I know it well, you know, a hatchling sauropod is feeding on stuff that the dick dick are eating. Mm. One that's a year old is eating the stuff that the diker are eating. One that's three years old is eating the stuff the zebra are eating and so on and so forth. So that then strips out a whole bunch of niches. So how do these two trade off? I don't have a clue. But ultimately, yes, the number needs to go up and it needs to go up a lot because I suspect that the niche occupation and the reduced diversity going back in time is way, way, way less than the numbers we need to add on and multiply by because we're sampling two or three percent of the earth's yeah. surface and, it, and a fraction of the environment you know look at how yeah. many yes you know we dig in deserts now but a lot of them were deserts then as well mm -hmm. and they're going to be low species diversity areas yeah it almost seemed like the 1500 or 1800 whatever number is based on like how many we'll find and it's like okay we might find that many but that has nothing to do with how many were actually yeah. there yeah i suspect you know 
ballpark pulled out of the air figure, but with a little bit of knowledge and intuition, you know, tens of thousands of species over hundreds of millions, you know, 100 million years, mm-hmm. 120 million years. It seems um, like it has to be to me. Pretty much. <laughs> but we'll see. Oh, yeah. One more little tidbit about that. It seems to me, and not being a zoologist, but when I look at birds, you'll see two birds that are super similar, but they can be in different genera. Whereas mm-hmm. in dinosaurs, as long as their bones were relatively similar, you yeah, might assume that, they were the yeah, same. Yeah, that, that's also totally an issue and one that I suspect is prevents us from splitting a lot of stuff. It's actually probably true in the areas where stuff is smaller and indeed the way we get a different kind of preservation. So actually, I'd say this is almost certainly true of some of the actually big pterosaur clusters. But yeah, things like Liaoning. You know, microraptors, two or three species, depending on quite who you believe, from a few hundred specimens that actually probably cover about 10 million years. Hmm. I am convinced there's probably 15 or 20 species in there. You try telling them apart based on the bones. We can't do it. And it's because as paleontologists, we're limited to a morphological species concept. And if we had a, a time machine to go back or those things were alive now, we could look at their behavior. We could look at their genetics. We could look at their, you know, ecology and go, ha, huh, you know what? Actually, those guys never breed with these guys. That's two species. We need to split them up. Can't, can't do it. Exactly. <laughs> can't, can't be done. So yeah, there are almost certainly a ton of cryptic species in at least a couple of these areas. Great. Well, you answered the question I've been wondering the most about for a long time. Oh, good. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, and as uh, so often the case, the answer is we don't really know. <laughs> or at least I'm pretty confident that those are the factors that are influencing it. Judging which one outweighs the other and by what kind of magnitude is... Yeah. Yeah, you know, this will probably increase it, this will probably shrink it. Okay, but multiply by 10 and divide by 2, <laughs> multiply by 5 and divide by 50. <laughs> yep. Okay, so uh, why don't you tell us about your new book, The Tyrannosaur Chronicles, and what people would learn if they read the book? Well, I, hopefully it's a kind of one-stop shop, start to finish, this is what tyrannosaurs were in every way that I can really get through them. <laughs> So it's not just T-Rex. It features very heavily, very inevitably, for actually a number of reasons, not just because it's obviously the most famous and arguably most popular. But, yeah, I really try to start at the beginning. Uh, So there is a little kind of introductory section with a bit of background on anatomy and systematics and how we put family trees together and the origins of the group. And then I kind of basically follow it through. What species have we got? Where are they from? How did they change over time what are their anatomical features what does that tell us then about how they moved lived fed ran killed each other what the ecosystems like who are they competing with who are they eating briefly on what killed the dinosaurs because tyrannosaurus was one of the last dinosaurs it would have seen the the asteroid coming in and then a little bit about kind of you know fact and fiction or um controversial areas so I, I hope, and at least a number of the reviews, and not just from friends and colleagues, but actually entirely independent naturalists and even just book reviewers in places have said, yep, you can pick this book up knowing little about dinosaurs, and it'll teach you the stuff you need to know, as in the stuff you need to know to understand it, and then it will take you through the whole subject. So yeah, that, that's kind of what it is. So it is a, hopefully a kind of self-enclosed thing or entity just on these dinosaurs and and the reason beyond it really does go it's not just a t-rex is awesome partly i picked the subject when i was asked to write a book by the publishers because i have worked on tyrannosaurs i've named a tyrannosaur i've done a fair bit of work on tyrannosaurs in particular them bite marks and feeding ecology and behavior but also because actually tyrannosaurus in particular is something of a model organism now for paleontology at least in dinosaurs in particular in that we know more about this animal than any others. It's had more research dedicated to it. We have more good specimens than many other species, and people have just worked on it endlessly. And once that happens, you get this enormous snowball effect because, okay, I want to work out how a dinosaur did this. Well, what dinosaur am I going to pick? Well, which one do we know most about that gives me the biggest foundation of knowledge? Well, it's T-Rex, so I pick T-Rex. And then I publish my paper, and the next guy comes along and goes, well, I want to work something out about dinosaur. <laughs> well, T-Rex has even more known about it now, so that's definitely the one I should pick. And on and on and on and on it goes. And so, you know, just as 
you know, every major project on genetics is done on Drosophila, the fruit fly. Every developmental work is done on uh, Cynorhabdis elegans, the, this little nematode worm. Mm -hmm. It's actually, if you're doing a big study on muscles or joints or speed or vision or predation behavior, you, you pick Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> That's what you do. And therefore, actually, if I had to pick a group of dinosaurs to write about, that's a small, comfortable group rather than all sauropods or all ceratopsians, it pretty much has to be the Tyrannosaurs because one above the rest, Tyrannosaurus rex, stands out as the animal that I can say most about with confidence because there are so many papers on it. Yeah. It's a great reason, and it is definitely the most popular dinosaur. There's a reason it's on our logo, oh, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd, I'd be lying if I said it certainly didn't help my case to the publishers when they went, well, everyone's heard of it. You know, however cool they are, the Ankylosaur Chronicles, and Ankylosaurs are awesome, it's not going to resonate with someone who's never picked up a dinosaur book yeah. before. Most people uh, don't even say, know. That's it. not why I wrote it, but equally, the publishers weren't going to publish a book that they didn't think people might buy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, after Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, you're starting to run out of the names that most people could name. Yep. You might have Velociraptor, but they're all imagining yeah, the wrong probably dinosaur. Yeah, Velociraptor, Spinosaurus, of course. Yeah, Tyrannosaurus is first among equals. And in fact, it's probably first among not equals <laughs> as, as well when it comes to uh, what people know. Actually, then, it, it's kind of a cool springboard in that sense, because then people do at least know the basics. They know it stands on its back legs. They know it's got a big head. They know it's a carnivore. They've seen it in Jurassic Park. You have a cultural touchstone when you want to relate to things. How quick was it? Now, that's a really hard question to ask to answer, and we're not great at it. As quick as that film, what you've done, seen 20 times, no, they exaggerated it. That's really easy to communicate, and that really helps. Hmm. So other than the speed in Jurassic Park, is there anything else that you think is a little bit off or anything you wish they would change the way they depicted? Oh, in the films? Yeah. Well, they stick feathers on it first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that improved my mood enormously. Yeah, that's the single greatest <laughs> annoyance is the lack of feathers. It, it, partly on Tyrannosaurus, obviously particularly on the Velociraptors, but you know, there's a whole four-hour podcast on what's wrong with Jurassic Park Velociraptors and how did they get there and why won't they change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one thing, at least it, for, for Jurassic World or the, or the newer films. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, the original one had some issues. The can't see you if you don't move, uh, run 30 miles an hour. Um, there are some... Uh, Let's say at best half truths in those uh, statements. It made a better monster movie though, so. Well, yeah, but that, but that's the problem is this this stuff sticks, and yeah. one argument that I get from people is, oh, but it's just a fiction, and people know the difference. One, no, not everyone <laughs> does. Um, a friend of mine at the Tyrrell Museum has said about once a year someone comes up to them and goes, well, where are the real ones? <laughs> <laughs> and it's because they've seen them in the cinema now, and they're so realistic that they assume that they don't think it's a documentary, but they think someone's actually done it. <laughs> That's and great. they're genuinely surprised. And we can, you know, you can always laugh and go, well, some people are so, so ignorant, so dumb. And it's like, okay, but if those people, if there are at least a fraction of the population dumb enough to think that we have actually recreated a T-Rex, but bizarrely, you've never seen it in a zoo or on TV how many people actually think that it's a realistic portrayal yeah and actually that's going to be a realistic percentage and there are um, so many people that that's probably the only t-rex they've ever seen depicted in any way so what else would yeah, they think almost certainly so yeah it's a big deal and it bleeds into other things i was one of a number of consultants on a tyrannosaur special and they wanted velociraptor attacking tyrannosaurus because it was in jurassic park <laughs> That, that they explicitly asked for it. And I said, don't do it, A, because they lived in different times and different places, yeah. and B, because it's ludicrous. Meerkats don't attack lions, yeah. even a whole pack of them. And that's about the thing you're making. It's probably more uh, realistic to show humans attacking a T-Rex yeah, than yeah. Velociraptor. Um, but in the final version, they had Dromaeosaurus, because, of course, that is from the same formation as Tyrannosaurus, or at least what Archaeoraptor, or one of them. And I haven't actually seen it because I couldn't bear to watch. I was assured that the voiceover said, of course, this would never happen normally, but we just want to show you it. <laughs> and if you believe that, I've got a Nigerian prince I know who um, 
has a few million dollars he'd like to transfer to your bank account. <laughs> um, but th- they wanted to show this because people wouldn't want a T-Rex documentary that didn't have it fighting dromaeosaurs. So it really does actually have a huge impact. And this was otherwise a very serious thing. And they were making tiny changes to the anatomy that I was suggesting. And then just being, yeah, but we're filming this full stop, end of story, no argument. Like, well, then what's the point of quibbling over the pupil shape in the eye if you're just going to show something like that? Because that's what people are going to remember, yeah. I can assure you. But there we go. <laughs> Are there any other links or things you want to talk about? Hmm, not in particular. Uh, buy the book, uh, the, Am- the link to Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is out in the US on the 5th of July, so it's not quite out yet. So it will be out shortly, and then the, the paperback will be out in the following year. No, I, yeah, you, you mentioned my blog. I have another blog at the Guardian newspaper, at least their, their online stuff called Lost Worlds Revisited, which I write with a number of other colleagues. I inevitably do the dinosaur bit. That's kind of it. I'm, I continue to pump out the outreach as and when I can, which is ever more restricted, having just spent the best part of two years writing a book, which oddly enough kind of ate into my time. But yeah, it's, um, if you hunt around on the web because you liked this and want to read more or hear more, there's lots on the blog and actually there's a link on there to all the various podcasts and YouTube interviews and stuff that I've done, which are all archived. So with various people. So if you're not sick of me after an hour, uh, <laughs> there's a few more hours out there answering often many of the same questions. So this this was quite different for once. Uh, normally, what's your favorite dinosaur is the highlight of the afternoon, <laughs> um, followed by who would win in a fight between T-Rex and Spinosaurus. So. Yeah. Our listeners are a little bit more advanced than most. Well, well, quite, which is why I was quite pleased that I actually got to talk about a rather than spending 20 minutes explaining what a looked like and why it's interesting. And then what a sauropod is. Um, yeah. so it does make a difference. Now on to the news. First, there's a new calculator on Purdue's website called Impact Earth! Exclamation point. And you can use it to calculate the effect of a given comet, meteor, or other impactor on Earth. And you can either manually enter the diameter, density, impact angle, impact velocity, impact type, whether it hits sedimentary rock, crystalline rock, or water depth. You can do if it's hitting the ocean or a lake, I guess. Or you can grab a famous crater. So, of course, I took the Chicxulub impact. And the unique thing is that you can put in your distance from the impact and it will tell you the particular effects that you would see from the impact if you were standing that distance right when the impact happened. So luckily in our case, the Bay Area is about 2,200 miles from the Chicxulub crater impact site. And on the bright side, it says that our effects would be only a dusting of material about 25 minutes after the impact ranging from 50 microns to about 8 millimeters in size, which isn't too big, it's smaller than hail, so, you know, you could survive that. And the fireball stays below the horizon, so we don't get cooked. Oh, that's which nice. Is a very big plus. There is a 10.3 earthquake, which, as you may know, is bigger than any earthquake that's ever happened in recorded history, not including geologic history, I guess. <laughs> And it might only affect us as if it was a four to five happening around here, which in California really isn't too bad. Of course, it could trigger an earthquake on one of the many faults in California, which might not be as small of an earthquake, but that's kind of like in the middle ground. On the downside, there would be an air blast about four hours after the impact that would hit at 80 miles an hour and 84 decibels, And since it's such a quick pulse and blast of air, it would probably shatter all of the glass windows pretty much on the continent. So that's not great. It's interesting that you were so optimistic (laughs) about this. Like, yeah, there's a dusting of material, but imagine breathing that in and, oh, it's only a 4 or 5.0 earthquake. Oh, wait, but that might trigger other earthquakes. (laughs) It might, but it could be a lot worse. So, for instance, in Havana, Cuba, which is about 500 miles away, And partly the reason I picked that is if you put any city that's within 100 miles, it says, well, you're just within the impact, so you would be thrown away from it. And it's also a similar distance to Tampa, Florida. That's like 600 miles or Corpus Christi, Texas. Anyway, in Havana, Cuba, 
you'd basically burst into flames immediately about 11 seconds after the impact because there would be a 50 minute long fireball that appeared right at the impact site and from Havana it would be about 50 times larger than the sun in appearance and have radiation more than 200 times the sun which is why everything burst into flames and then after the radiation starts cooking you you'd get showered in five foot rocks at the seven minute mark and then at the 40 minute mark a 1200 mile an hour wind at 115 decibels would basically flatten every building in the city that hadn't already burned down and collapsed. And then, finally, at the seven-hour mark, in case there's anything that's still around, a 30- to 60-foot tsunami would roll in and probably just wash away the burned wreckage. That is much worse. Yeah. (laughs) So if you want to check how a huge impact would affect you and how far away it is. I played with a bunch of other things too. It's like, what if Chicxulub was made entirely out of iron rather than this more, you know, porous rock that isn't as bad. You can check the link in this week's blog post and put your distance from the impact site. If you don't know your distance, you can go to Google maps and you can right click just off the shore of Merida, Mexico and use the measure distance tool. And that's what I did to figure out how far we were. And one last interesting note, it mentions that the Chicxulub impact, depending on the impact angle, because you can't quite tell exactly from the crater, it may have either shortened or lengthened the Earth day by up to 8 milliseconds, but the orbit and tilt weren't affected. So that's good. (laughs) I guess. (laughs) And that an impact of this size is estimated to happen only about once every 4 billion years. So hopefully, since it's only been about 66 million years, we'll be okay for a while. Good news. (laughs) On a far different note, in India, a team from Jaina Ray and Vyas University has found a new set of footprints belonging to the theropod Eubrontes glenarensensis. The tracks are large, about 30 centimeters long, and scientists estimate that this dinosaur was between 3 to 9.8 feet or 1 to 3 meters tall and 16 to 23 feet or 5 to 7 meters long. Cool. Yeah, they found other fossils and teeth of this kind of dinosaur before, but this is the first time they found footprints. Yeah, we don't hear about too many dinosaur discoveries in India, so that's an interesting find. Mm Mm-hmm. Next... Dinosaur fossils may not be as valued as they used to be. In early June, a nearly complete duck-billed dinosaur known as Freya, which we actually talked about before, went on auction, but it was sold at auction for 95,000 pounds, and that was considered a bargain. And according to the New York Times and Inverse, in late May, there was the nearly complete Stegosaurus skeleton that went up for auction in Germany, and it was valued at $2.7 million, but nobody bid on it. And this keeps happening. In 2013, the Montana dueling dinosaurs, which is a tyrannosaur and a ceratopsid in a death match, were valued at between seven and nine million dollars, but the highest bid was 5.5 million. And the owners thought that that was not enough, so they didn't take the deal, and now the fossil is in a vault, which is sad. Yeah. According to Inverse, these inflated prices for dinosaurs started with Sue the T Rex, which the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago won after a bidding war for $8.4 million, and they had help from McDonald's and Disney. And the fear at the time was that Sue would end up in a private collection where people would not be able to study her. And since then, museums have been competing with investors for dinosaur bones, but now people aren't bidding as much to collect dinosaurs, at least privately. And part of this is that sometimes it turns out that dinosaurs were exported illegally. On the bright side, this may mean that museums might be able to buy fossils for less money, maybe... These bidding wars will stop. Although we did have one listener who did mention on Facebook that this is not always the case. There's still auctions that do exceed expectations, so hard to say. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that that nearly complete Freya only sold for 95,000 pounds. But I guess nobody really cares about Hattersaurs. Also, this is the zoo that wanted to get rid of everything. It was like a... (laughs) liquidation (laughs) a little bit yeah people probably knew they were kind of desperate to get rid of it so interesting 
Next, a company called Research Casting International in Ontario, Canada, had this really cool short two-minute video that showed how they build dinosaur skeletons. So in the video, Peter May, the owner and president, explains how they work. And they have a 50,000 square foot building where they can build these big skeletons. And they do skeletons other than dinosaurs, but I'm just going to focus on the dinosaur ones. So they've mounted and displayed about 800 skeletons, including T-Rex and Allosaurus skeletons, and they keep about 50 skeletons in crates in their back room. It takes about 10 people to prepare and mount the fossils, and they call themselves the Skeleton Crew, which is a pretty cool name. They unpack the fossils from the crates, and then the conservation team cleans and hardens them, and then blacksmiths work on it, and then the mounting team puts it together. And in the past, they've built the two skeletons in Jurassic Park... I believe that means the T-Rex at the end, skeleton in that final scene. And they've also built the rearing controversial Barosaurus in the American Museum of Natural History. Yeah, I think that might be the group that's working on the Smithsonian dinosaurs, too. Could be. So they expect their skeletons to last about 100 years while on exhibit at a museum. And Peter May said in the video, quote, Our job is to bring the old skeletons to life. And currently they're working on building two Dryptosaurus skeletons with one leaping on top of another. (laughs) It's funny. Yeah. Probably wouldn't be funny if you were the one getting leapt on, but... No. Going on a museum tangent, at the Royal Tyrell Museum in Canada, dinosaurs have been clothed courtesy of some mystery knitters. The museum has a new exhibit called Foundations, which is tied to the quote-unquote yarn bombing. And that's because the theme of this exhibit is about unraveling the mystery of Earth. The mystery knitters were all volunteers, and the dinosaur knits are very colorful. There's an image of three ceratopsians in striped sweaters. After about a week, they'll take the clothes off the dinosaurs, and then the fabric will be given to somebody who needs it. (laughs) Like the Incredible Hulk or somebody that needs an enormous sweater. (laughs) (laughs) I think they might repurpose, but yeah. I guess. I'd rather just have a full-sized ceratops sweater. You could use it like as a blanket or something. (laughs) Hmm. That'd be funny. Apparently not everyone was happy about the sweaters on the Ceratops. Well, it, I might be a little bit disappointed if when we went to the Royal Terrell Museums, half the dinosaurs were covered in <laughs> sweaters, so you couldn't really see them. Or excited. The picture was just of three of them that are outside of the museum. Replicas. Oh, okay. Well, then that's not really a big deal. Next, a new exhibit called Ultimate Dinosaurs opened up on June 11th at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa. The exhibit has 16 skeletons, and they'll be on display until September 5th, and they include South American dinosaurs, such as Titanosaurs and Gigantosaurus. Cool. Yep. The Lakeland Wildlife Oasis in the UK now has a fiberglass T-Rex skull to greet visitors. The skull is nicknamed Lucy, after the first discovered hominin species. Mm. And Dave Marsden, one of the co-founders of Lakeland Wildlife Oasis, made this skull, and he said that the hardest part of making it was the teeth. Quote, each one had to be set individually. Fixing the fiberglass onto the strong plinth was also a battle, taking over a week to get right. And that's the kind of stand that it's on. It looks cool, though, in the picture. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Making things out of fiberglass does seem a little bit tricky. It's kind of like making a wrap and then solidifying it and trying to hold it together. Yeah. And next, some of you might know that the Queen... Of England. Yes, recently turned 90. And to celebrate, people at John Whitehead Park got to play with Diago the dinosaur. And it was a man dressed in a very realistic dinosaur costume. This one was a theropod. They put a collar on it, and then they let children come up and pet the dinosaur. Mm. And then afterwards, they had tea. Really? (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. I thought you might have just made that up since they were in England. Nope, that was in the article. High tea with the dinosaur. I don't think the dinosaur drank any tea. They put him in a little suit? No. (laughs) Just a collar. He held his, like, one of his two fingers out if he's a (laughs) (laughs) T-Rex. Thanks to Brendan on Facebook and Aiden on Twitter for this one. Someone attempted to run the American Ninja Warrior course in one of those inflatable T-Rex costumes. And it's a really entertaining video. I was really impressed with how far they made it in the costume. 
But not surprisingly, the obstacle called the spin cycle, where a long reach is really important, is the one that knocked it out. It looked like he modified it a little bit so that he could get his real arms out, but I think he still couldn't really reach I all the way to the sides. the weight of the costume and the floppy head was hindering the person inside. It might have been, but it, it didn't seem to bother him that much. It's definitely worth watching. We posted a link in our blog post, so you should check it out. And if there is some kind of award for best costume design just for regular people, I think whoever designed this inflatable T-Rex one definitely deserves it because we keep seeing people using this costume in all sorts of creative ways. So I think it's the coolest costume around. Halloween idea. Yeah. As long as you have like $80 to spend on a costume. It's a little steep. If we just wear it for the next 10 years. <laughs> We're always in T-Rex costumes. We could give it a little hat or something, spice it up. That's true. Or we could have one of us in it and then wear a collar just like they did in the UK. And have high tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next up, a game developer called Gorilla Games. And that's the group that made the Kill Zone series is working on a new game called Horizon Zero Dawn. You play as an archer in a futuristic world, sort of futuristic because you're an archer, but anyway, there's machines all over the place, and a lot of them are pretty dinosaur-like, and it looks like some of them are good guys, and then some of them get corrupted and then start attacking people. So, of course, you have to go and stop these corrupted dinosaur robot thingies that are going to kill everybody. From what I can tell, all of the Guerrilla Games creations so far have been PlayStation exclusives, so this game will probably be a PlayStation exclusive too. It's slated for release on PlayStation 4 sometime in 2017. Since it's still early, it's hard to tell how much of it will be dinosaur-like and how much will be other creations. There was a pretty big mix in the E3 preview they just gave, so it's kind of hard to tell which way they're going to go with it. Another dinosaur-related game, Ark Survival Evolved, is getting an update. They're adding a quote-unquote titanosaur, named just like the American Museum of Natural History specimen. I don't know if that's why they decided to name it just titanosaur. Most of the animals in the game have pretty generic names, so that might be why. It's super over-the-top huge. You can even build a small town on its back, and its back is also covered in osteoderms. But it seems like it might be a little bit cumbersome to try to maneuver since it's so huge. Does it not notice that you built something on its back? Well, the whole thing with Ark Survival Evolved is that you get to tame dinosaurs. Oh. I just started playing it again yesterday, and it takes so long to get started because it starts out like naked and afraid where you're just like a naked dude and you have to go find rope and then you can make clothes and then you can you know, figure out how to make an axe, and then eventually you can get to a point where you tame a dinosaur. That's the next thing I need to do. Still don't have a dinosaur tamed. Mm. They're also adding a redwood forest, and it's going to take over a chunk of the existing map later this month, but the map is about 36 square kilometers, which is about 14 square miles, not including elevation effects and caves and the water. So it's such an enormous map that you know, they didn't think it would really impact that much. Although the server that I just started playing in has this huge, like, castle built right in the middle of the thing that's going to get annihilated. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> but the most exciting news is that they're making an official version of a popular mod called Ark Primal Survival. And in that version, you'll get to play as dinosaurs or other animals in the game. It looks like a lot of fun. But the extent of the actions looks like it's pretty much eat, mate, and attack. And nothing is particularly scientifically accurate, largely because the animals in the game span at least 150 million years with stegosaurs and like mammoths and dire wolves and stuff. They're sort of in different areas, but they do wander around. So you get these really weird fights going on between like a bear and a dinosaur. <laughs> but it could still be fun. I'm definitely going to try it, especially since it's going to be a little while till Saurian is out. Maybe it'll get me by until then. And lastly, recently a few new pieces of concept art from the cancelled Jurassic Park 4 film were released. And as a reminder, Jurassic Park 4 was under development around 2005, 
but later got canceled and then got completely rewritten and they created Jurassic World. Which I think is for the best. Yeah, definitely. After seeing the concept art, I'm really glad that Jurassic Park 4 got canceled because I'm pretty sure it would have just completely killed the entire franchise. I guess since Jurassic Park 3 wasn't a big blockbuster, they decided they needed to do something more exciting. And what's more exciting than a human-dinosaur hybrid? Exciting or creepy? Yeah, super creepy. There are two pieces of concept art that reminded me of King Shark in The Flash, which to me is not a good thing because I thought that was one of the goofiest looking characters I'd ever seen. But anyway, basically, you've got a hulk size and shaped human with either a Triceratops or a T-Rex head going along with it. So it's just like a big monster person with, you know, dinosaur head. And those were actually kind of the cooler, less creepy ones. The really creepy ones that look like they belong in a horror movie were these freaky combinations that look more like a deformed person with big claws and a ton of sharp teeth and a huge mouth and no eyelids. So, yeah, I'm really glad that didn't make it. Yeah. And I think one of them was unofficially dubbed Raptor Man. Yeah, one of them did have, like, raptor legs to go along with some other creepiness. So in comparison, Indominus Rex more or less being a cross between Spinosaurus and T-Rex does not seem like much of a stretch, and I'm glad they were relatively conservative in that way. Hopefully the new Jurassic World doesn't bring back human-dinosaur hybrids. I doubt it, but please don't. <laughs> <laughs> and before we get into our dinosaur of the day, our sponsor this week, Audible, is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial. We recently published one of our dinosaur books written and read by Sabrina on Audible. It's titled What Happened to Brontosaurus, and you can get it for free. We've mentioned this before. To download your free audiobook today, just go to audibletrial.com slash I know dino. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash I know dino for your free audiobook. And once you're there, you can search for Brontosaurus and you can find our book or as a reminder, we're going to be interviewing author Jeff Jones next week, and he wrote The Dinosaur 4, which is also available on Audible, so you might want to listen to that before we talk to him. The Dinosaur 4 definitely has some more serious themes, more like a Jurassic Park 2 situation, and he describes it as a adult B-movie time travel thriller, which I think is a perfect description of his book if you're into... A little bit more cheesy, but still fun sci-fi dinosaur stuff. It's a really good read. And it's definitely an exciting and pretty clever book, so you could check it out for free. If you'd like to check out those books or any other audiobooks, just go to audibletrial.com slash I know dino, and you'll get your free book, and we'll get the credit for sending you there, and everybody wins. Win, win, win. Yep. <laughs> And just as a reminder, the audiobooks are yours to keep, even if you cancel the service after the first free month. So don't feel intimidated by the monthly subscription. And now on to the dinosaur of the day, Oranosaurus, which was a request from Cole via Patreon. So thanks, Cole. The name means brave lizard, and the word Oran is Arabic and means courageous or bold. And some nomads in Niger, where it was found, call local monitor lizards Orane. The type species is Oranosaurus nigeriensis, and the species name refers to Niger, the country where it was found. Paleontologist Philip Tuket named Oranosaurus in 1976, and he found the bones in January of 1965, and the fossils were excavated in 1966. He first used the name in July 1972 at a public presentation of the skeleton, and two specimens have been found, one in 1965 and one in 1972. The holotype is of a nearly complete skeleton and a skull, and it's mounted in the capital of Niger, Niamey, and you can see a cast at the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle. Taquette's memoir called Dinosaur Impressions, Postcards from a Paleontologist, said that the first Arenosaurus specimen, quote, was placed in the National Museum of Niger, Niamey, inaugurated by the president of the National Assembly of that country, Bobu Hama, a small Niger girl very timid and cute, with her plated braids dressed like an Oranosaur and silk colored like the Niger flag, and presented the president with a pair of scissors to cut the ribbon across the entry door, end quote. 
That's an awesome way to open an exhibit. <laughs> it is. So Aranosaurus was an herbivore that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Africa. And Taket said that it weighed about 4 tons and was 23 feet or 7 meters long, but Gregory S. Paul in 2010 said it was probably 2.2 tons and 27 feet or 8.3 meters long. It had a short tail, a short, flexible neck, and it had thumb claws or spikes on each hand and broad hoof-like second and third fingers, which means that it may have been able to walk on them, so it may have been quadrupedal. It had narrow feet with three toes each, and pretty short forelimbs, about 55% the length of the hind limbs, and it could also walk bipedally. The femur was longer than the tibia, and where the muscles connected to the base of the tail was weakly developed, so it was probably not a fast runner. The skull was as high as it was wide, and it was about 36 inches or 67 centimeters long and had a long flat head and a long snout. It had small rounded horns in front of its eyes and a low bump between the nose and eye on each side of its face, Though why it's there, it's not clear, possibly for mating displays or socialization purposes. It probably spent a lot of time as a quadrupedal for grazing on low-lying plants, and it probably browsed low vegetation. It had a broad beak, somewhat like a duck-billed hadrosaurid, which it used to pull soft, leafy plants from out of the water. Its nostrils were high on the snout, so it was easier to breathe while eating low vegetation. Again, it had a wide beak, but it also had cheek teeth. And it had two sets of teeth, one set for replacement teeth. It probably ate tough plants, as well as fruits and seeds, in addition to the leafy plants. And this is because it could eat tougher plants with its cheek teeth. Although, probably not too tough, because it had weak jaw muscles. It had a large sail on its back with long neural spines, so it looked somewhat like a Spinosaurus. Though Spinosaurus and Aranosaurus lived millions of years apart. Its spines were probably covered in skin, and the supporting spines were thick and flat, and the spines at the back were stiff and bound together with ossified tendons, and the tallest spines were over its forelimbs. And these, the tallest spines, were nearly 2 feet or 0.6 meters tall. The spines may have been used for thermal regulation, display, or as some kind of hump with muscle, tissue, or fat like a camel that was used to store energy. It's possible this, the hump would have helped in case of a low rainy season, but it's unclear. In 1997, Dr. Jack Bowman Bailey from Western Illinois University said that Aranosaurus spines looked like a modern bison's, but not everyone agrees since it may not have needed to store fat. Bailey's paper was published in the Journal of Paleontology, and it was called From Neural Spine Elongation in Dinosaurs, Sailbacks or Buffalobacks. Hmm. And he wrote that Aranosaurus and Spinosaurus and other long-spined dinosaurs had more bison-like humps than sails because they lived in tropical climates and probably didn't need a sail for thermal regulation, and that humps were probably used to store energy, help shield from heat, help with long-distance migration, and help with conserving energy when nesting or brooding. Yeah, we see that debate a lot, the difference between sails and humps. And even on different dinosaurs, sometimes the prevailing argument will be edging towards one or the other. It's kind of still all over the place. I think that's one of the big mysteries still out there. Yeah. What we do know is that Aranosaurus lived in a river delta, and other dinosaurs included Lurdosaurus and Nigrosaurus, and there were also fish and pterosaurs and sharks. A possible predator to it was Suchomimus, which was primarily a fish eater but also lived near the river delta and could have gone after juvenile Aranosaurus. Another potential threat was Carcharodontosaurus, and also Sarcosuchus, which was a giant crocodile. Originally, Aranosaurus was considered to be part of Iguanodontidae, because it had a similar thumb spike, but now it's considered to be part of the clad Hadrosauroidea as a basal hadrosauroid. And Hadrosauroidea is a clad of dinosaurs that includes the duckbill dinosaurs, hadrosaurids, and dinosaurs more closely related to them than Iguanodon. Cool. Our fun fact of the day starts with something you probably already know. So humans have two types of sex chromosomes, X and Y, and every embryo gets an X from the egg, and if the sperm has an X, the resulting is an XX female, while a Y makes an XY male. But some animals, including birds, have what's called a ZW scheme, where the egg alone determines the gender, and unlike humans, the homogametic sex is the male with a ZZ, and the female has a ZW. Interestingly, crocodiles and alligators don't even have sex chromosomes at all, and the gender is instead determined by temperature, with higher temperatures typically resulting in more males. Since all modern birds have ZW genes, 
it's more likely that non-avian dinosaurs also had ZW genes than this temperature-related situation, but it's hard to tell for sure since DNA doesn't fossilize, so it's kind of hard to know what chromosomes they had. Yeah. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you're a dinosaur enthusiast and want to join fellow dinosaur enthusiasts, then please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.